It began with a distant voice in a war-torn era of propaganda and fear. Now we call it uh, Japan bashing, but at that time it was very symptomatic of um, taking an individual and making her larger than life. Uh, and this person then becomes symbolic of all Japanese Americans. And when people are willing to believe that kind of story, then all of us suffer. And all of us did suffer during that period. She was stranded between two countries at war and steadfastly maintained that she was an American. It's the story of uh, a woman who was caught up in the winds of war. I mean, buffeted about by these incredible events, literally caught as a victim and a scapegoat. The Tokyo Rose never really existed except in the minds of the American public and, of course, originally in the minds of American servicemen during the war. But when the war was over, history would have its object of flame. The story of Tokyo Rose is laced with uh, all sorts of uh, fascinating irony because the person ultimately identified as the Tokyo Rose was in every way very much an Americanized Japanese who was in fact very loyal uh, to the United States and yet as a victim of circumstances uh, ultimately was prosecuted as being Tokyo Rose. It was a sound the GIs strained to hear from their lonely posts in the Pacific. It reminded them of home and broke the monotony of war. That is why two million Americans stationed in the Pacific Theater during World War II made so much of a voice on the radio, a voice they called Tokyo Rose. I was a gunnery officer for a while, and uh, the crew listened to uh, the Tokyo Rose broadcasts uh, with particular delight. It was simply a woman's voice and with an American slang uh, talking to us from Tokyo. And that, that seemed kind of marvelously romantic to us. But it was not romance that singled one woman out for many women who broadcast during World War II and convicted her as the traitor called Tokyo Rose. Ironically, she was born an American on Independence Day. Her real name, Iva Taguri. Yeah, Iva Taguri was born in Los Angeles on the 4th of July, 1916. Her family had moved around quite a bit in California, and finally, uh, in 1928, her father settled down, become a small grocer and an importer of Japanese goods in Los Angeles. And there Iva grew up, uh, living mostly in white neighborhoods, uh, attending schools that were mostly white. In fact, her playmates were mostly white. But in America during the 1920s, Iva Taguri was seen as different from her white playmates. Caught between two cultures, she was what the Japanese called Nisei. Ni in Japanese means two, and Sei means generation. So it, it means a second generation Japanese, which is to say uh, an American citizen because she was born in the United States and thus has American citizenship built in from the moment she draws her first breath. But her parents were Japanese. In 1916, and right up to World War II, uh, the Japanese were really, uh, quotes, a problem minority. And the problem came about because we were not allowed to participate equally in the mainstream. Iva Taguri aspired to be the typical American teenager. Growing up in Los Angeles, she wore bobby socks and had a crush on Jimmy Stewart. By 1934, she was college bound. Iva went to UCLA and wanted to be a doctor. Um, she majored in zoology, loved going out with a biologist into the field on trips. She was cute, she was pert, uh, other students liked her. She graduated from UCLA in 1941 with plans to go to medical school. But then a cruel twist of fate occurred that began a long series of hardships. Her mother's sister, 
in Japan became ill. Her mother was ill herself and could not travel back to Japan. It was a strong tradition. So both as a graduation gift and also as sort of an emissary from the family, Iva was sent by her parents back to Japan to visit a sick aunt. After a three-week uh, voyage, uh, Iva arrived in Japan. Uh, there she found almost everything uh, to her uh, dislike, great dislike, in fact. Uh, she didn't like food, uh, liked uh, rice least of all, and was a stranger to the customs uh, and the traditions of the society. She felt very much uh, like an alien. By the fall of 1941, as World War II entered its third year in Europe, hostility was also brewing between the United States and Japan. Japan's interests were expansion, uh, and, and Japan took advantage of the war in Europe and all the turmoil to send its troops to occupy all of Southeast Asia. The United States embargoed oil and other war materials bound for Japan. This provoked the Japanese to counter with a surprise attack on the U.S. Pacific naval base in Oahu, Hawaii, at Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The results were devastating. 18 U.S. ships were hit, more than 200 aircraft destroyed or damaged and some 2,400 Americans were killed. The attack was a political and psychological blunder for Japan. It served as the catalyst that brought the United States into the war, and it mobilized U.S. public opinion against the Japanese. Tangled in what was now a war between the United States and Japan, Iba Tagori tried to book passage home to California. There is a delay because at the desk they say you are Nisi and therefore, quote, your citizenship is in doubt. Now she was a full citizen, there was no doubt, but at that time it reflects sort of the attitude. Uh, citizenship was in doubt to a second generation Japanese. The last ship bound for America sailed without her. Iba Tagori was stranded in Japan. Almost immediately, after war erupted between the United States and Japan, uh, Japanese secret police came and visited Iva Taguri and demanded that she renounce her American citizenship and pledge loyalty to the Japanese emperor. Uh, she refused to do so. Caught in what was now the enemy fortress of Japan, Iva was classified an enemy alien and denied a food ration card. By virtue of being a Japanese-American, she aroused a great deal of suspicion as well as uh, antagonism and animosity in uh, her relative's neighborhood. In fact, sometimes they threw rocks and sometimes they uh, chased her with uh, bamboo sticks. And Eventually, she decided it was best for the family if she moved out, and she did. She moved into a boarding house. Had she made it back home at this point, she would not have fared much better. Back in the United States, the situation could not possibly have been worse. I suppose they were, there was a period of intense uh, anti-enemy, quote unquote, feelings, especially against the Japanese, more against the Japanese than against the Germans, because the Germans had not bombed Pearl Harbor. In 1942, the government began a program of forced relocation for Japanese Americans on the West Coast and called it internment. The motivation for the government rounding up the Japanese and putting them into camps was the belief that they were a danger, that they were the Trojan horse, that their loyalties were to the Japanese government, that they were infiltrating our country at the heart. But in retrospect, it seems a drastic and draconian measure. so startlingly efficient you know they just put notices on the telephone poles and people of Japanese ancestry were supposed to register and line up it was just an impersonal kind of thing saying you just have to go 
While Iva is trying to survive in uh, wartime Japan, her family is being relocated to internment camps in the United States along the western edge, pulled back from the coastline. Iva Tagori would not learn of her family's hardship for three years. By then, she would be ensnared in a wartime myth called Tokyo Rose. The year was 1942. Iva Tagori turned 26 and remained trapped in Japan by the chaos of war, isolated and removed from her life back home. I think she reports things that she most liked when the father sent her the Los Angeles Times that she so enjoyed reading about what was going on back in the States. But the messages stopped coming in from the States and Ivo would be unaware of the relocation program that had disrupted the Japanese-American community and the hardship in her own family. It caused hardship in a number of ways. In the case of the Tuguris, Mrs. Tuguri was not well to begin with and eventually died in camp. Ivo would not learn of her mother's death for three years. An enemy alien in Japan Iva had little money left from home and could have starved. Renouncing her American citizenship would have saved her. Changing your citizenship was literally as easy as signing a piece of paper. She did not. She says uh, a tiger does not change its stripes. Since she had refused to take Japanese citizenship, she eventually lost her ration card. So um, she had to live on other people's food, which was, of course, at black market rates or bribing friends to give her food. Um, so it was really a financial problem, that's all. And the only uh, quality she had was that she could speak fluent English. She needed a job. So she went to an English-speaking um, newspaper where she could use her English and got a job listening to the shortwave radio casts from the United States and then typing them up in English, transcribing them for someone else to uh, then put in the newspaper while still working for the news agency monitoring American uh, broadcasts in the Pacific, uh, Iva got a second job. This was with uh, Radio Tokyo, the Japanese broadcasting uh, corporation. At first, she's simply a typist. Uh, there, she would help type scripts for programs aimed at Americans in the Pacific, these propagandistic uh, broadcasts. In this film that was made for GI audiences after the war, Iva Tagori agreed to describe these events from her point of view. I had to look for another job, and I started around and found on at Radio Tokyo. I picked again. Well, one day, studio officials auditioned me quite unexpectedly for the lead on a uh, special program being to GIs in the Pacific, and they said that the purpose was solely entertainment. The program was to be called The Zero Hour, an intimidating title that brought to mind both the most feared Japanese fighter plane, The Zero, and The Zero Hour, the moment before an attack. Until now, the English-speaking writers and broadcasters at Radio Tokyo had been drawn from a nearby POW camp. Conditions there were harsh, and Iva smuggled fruit and vitamins to the men to ward off malnutrition. She also earned their trust. Among these POWs was an Australian major named Cousins. It was Charles Cousins, a POW, who wrote the scripts for the Zero Hour, who decided to choose Iva Taguri out of the typing pool to add that feminine touch and that female voice to the Zero Hour broadcasts. Working with Cousins was Captain Wallace Ince, an American POW who had also been a broadcaster. Both men had been tortured and coerced at the point of a sword into working at Radio Tokyo. They approached her and said, look, we'll write the script. You don't have to worry about that. We'll tell you what to say. We're not going to tell you to say anything treasonous or anything bad. All we want you to do is read our words. 
She was nervous about doing the program because it obviously was uh, in the service of Japanese propaganda, but she had no means of refusing. And the only reason she agreed uh, it wasn't just to preserve her ration card, it was because uh, Major Cousins told her, I'm writing the script, I'm in charge. Consider yourself as a soldier under my orders. I will not let you do anything against your own country. In mid-November 1943, Iva Tagori found herself in front of a microphone hosting the Zero Hour. In that same army film, she reenacted it for the GIs. What you need is a good guy. I mean solid. Helps you relax. All set? Okay, here's the first row at your morale. Two guys are singing and singing. Hey, Pop, I don't want to go to work. Are you still listening? The Zero Hour is broadcast over Radio Tokyo by shortwave uh, throughout the Pacific. The idea was to demoralize the American troops, tell the uh, Marines and the GIs that back home their girl had run off with somebody else, that in fact uh, they would remain isolated on these jungle-clad islands in the Pacific, that they were orphans of the Pacific. People used to run and listen to her and say she was on. She was always disappointing. She never really did say the sexy things that were attributed to her. At least I never heard them. Um, it, it, it was just the idea of a, of a young American woman's voice broadcasting from Tokyo. But Iva Tagori did not call herself Tokyo Rose on the radio. She was Anne for announcer and later Orphan Anne. There was never a Tokyo Rose on Radio Tokyo, but there were as many as 20 English-speaking voices, women, who broadcast a variety of programs. Some of them uh, propagandized very hard, but never on the zero hour. And they didn't all sound alike. On the same zero hour broadcast, this female voice was introduced as Dutchie. This multiple voice broadcasting led to the description of Tokyo Rose from a composite of at least 20 women's voices. The soldier's collective image, the sailor's collective image was some sort of sultry, geisha-like creature who was um, uh, relieving the monotony of being tossed around on a storm on a boat. Think of it. You've been maybe for months or years in the Pacific and you tune in your shortwave radio to get some kind of voice that's different to uh, the military broadcasts. And you hear uh, the siren coming across the waves, this Asian um, goddess somewhere on the other edge of the Pacific. It must have been quite uh, glamorous and alluring. From the loneliness of steamy Quonset huts and lurching ships far out in the Pacific, American servicemen were building the fantasy of Tokyo Rose on the radio. While in Tokyo, Iva Tagori wished only to return home. Hello and hello to you fighting orphans in the Pacific Water. This is your playmate Orphan Anne, taking your call on a Tuesday evening. By the summer of 1943, there was probably no American soldier in the Pacific who had not heard of Tokyo Rose. She had become the emblem of Japan, even though she existed only in the minds of the Americans stationed here. Tokyo Rose was an American invention. Uh, we just don't know uh, when or how it came into the lexicon. Some people say uh, already by late 1942 it was in use in the Pacific to describe uh, female broadcasters over Radio Tokyo. Uh, certainly it was in general use uh, by the summer and fall of 1943 in the Pacific. And eventually, uh, Tokyo Rose and Orphan Anne 
became synonymous. Ida Tagore playfully addressed her audience as boneheads. She threatened to annihilate them with her nail file and was unaware that the legend of Tokyo Rose would blossom. I don't think she had any notion that the character Tokyo Rose was building in the American imagination and the troops and the folks back home, that they were building an image and, and that she was stepping into the image at all. As Orphan Anne, Iva Tagori participated in 340 broadcasts of the Zero Hour. Still, their value as propaganda is questionable. Her broadcasts uh, probably did very little to demoralize any troops in the Pacific, other than calling GIs and Marines uh, boneheads and uh, talking about American phantom ships that had been sunk. Um, there's really no evidence that she had much of an effect on the uh, morale of the troops or even uh, was responsible for disseminating uh, that much uh, propaganda or disinformation. By 1945, Iva had been working in Tokyo for nearly three years. During this time, she had met Philippe D'Aquino, a Portuguese citizen and pacifist living in Japan. Their bond as outsiders turned into love. They were married that April, and Iva hoped one day for a new life together in America. He tried to persuade her to become a Portuguese citizen like he was. Very simple. Again, signing a piece of paper. She did not want to give up her American citizenship. History would be written in swift strokes during the months following the couple's marriage. By the summer of 1945, Japan was losing its war. Strategic bombing would destroy half of Tokyo, and scores of Japanese cities had been leveled by Allied raids. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. On August 9th, the second atom bomb fell in Nagasaki. In two days, nearly 300,000 Japanese people were killed or injured. The war was over. On September 2nd, General Douglas MacArthur accepted Japan's formal surrender on the deck of the U.S. battleship Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Bay. He then disembarked for the shore to lead the American occupation of Japan. Tokyo was pretty, pretty much destroyed. Uh, all the infrastructure had evidently disappeared, and therefore you could identify with anyone caught in that period where it was devastation and almost total dependence on the United States government or the United States Army for any kind of law and order. As MacArthur and the Army came into Japan, so did the war correspondents. They were all out for large interviews. The major one was to get the Emperor, which of course was impossible. The second was to get the Prime Minister, which was almost impossible. The third was to get General MacArthur, which apart from a few news conferences was not impossible but difficult. And the fourth, if you can't do anything else, get Tokyo Rose. The hunt for Tokyo Rose had begun, but there was a problem. No one named Tokyo Rose actually existed. She was, of course, a legend. There was even rumor that she was actually Amelia Earhart, the famed aviatrix who had disappeared in the Pacific in 1937. But while the speculation continued, two employees of the Hearst News Empire planned to scoop all the others in the rush to find Tokyo Rose. The journalists were Clark Lee of the International News Service and Harry Brundage of Cosmopolitan Magazine. When Clark Lee and Harry Brundage uh, went to Radio Tokyo to find Tokyo Rose, the other employees said, well, we don't know anyone here who went by that name and we're Japanese citizens, but..." They must be talking about Iva. The lavish Imperial Hotel in downtown Tokyo would be partially destroyed by the bombing raids of the war. But some rooms were in use in the fall of 1945, 
and journalists Brundage and Lee had checked in. It was here on September 1st that Iva Tagori was invited for an interview about her experience on the radio. Harry Brundage of Cosmopolitan Magazine told Iva that the magazine would pay her $2,000, a great sum of money in those days, especially in Japan, for an exclusive interview. And certainly, this was a lure that brought Eva Taguri to the hotel. And when she walked in, she was feeling good. The Americans had won, and they've come to liberate her. She had no idea, one, that she could have been Tokyo Rose, uh, or two, that she was going to be charged or that it had been a crime. And so she was rather kidding. When she came in, they said, are you Tokyo Rose? And she said, yep, I'm Tokyo Rose, I think. But just in a, in a kidding way. But the news reporters at the Imperial Hotel weren't kidding. There, they interviewed her for almost four hours. Clark Lee at a typewriter, firing questions at Iva and uh, typing them up, 17 pages of notes, in fact. And at the conclusion of that, uh, Iva Degree signed those, saying that, in fact, she was the one and only Tokyo Rose. Two days later, Clark Lee's incendiary column would appear in American newspapers. He accused the UCLA graduate of poisoning the minds of American troops for $6 a month. By the war's end, Iva Tagori was a sort of celebrity in Japan, but she was also naive. Perhaps that is what led her to appear in the Army's post-war film about her supposed activities as Tokyo Rose. Well, I can just say I enjoyed seeing the CI. And as uh, far as the news announcements are concerned, I admit they're a little confusing at times. And uh, I often wondered uh, how many times the American fleet was going to be sunk before the show was over. She herself was extremely foolish. She t tended to walk into this role anyway. Uh, she would mug for the cameras. She would uh, do everything possible. She assumed that she was the GI sweetheart and that Tokyo Rose was some sort of heroine of the war. She seemed to be uh, upbeat, vivacious, ebullient. She uh, had seemingly no misgivings about accepting that title. And in fact, her husband warned her, thought she might be getting herself into trouble. In fact, Iva Tagori would soon face a trouble that would tear the center out of her life and shatter her dreams for the future. Fact or fiction, in 1945, Tokyo Rose was big news in post-war Japan. The correspondents and photographers focused their attention on Iva Taguri. But her husband, Philippe, had become uneasy about Iva's dubious publicity. The army seemed much too interested. Late in the fall of 1945, the army begins to investigate Iva Taguri as a traitor learning, of course, of her American citizenship, her American birth. Now her broadcasting for the Japanese uh, might come under the treason clause in the Constitution. Instructed only to bring a toothbrush, Iva was arrested in Tokyo and driven to Yokohama for questioning by the Army Counterintelligence Corps, the CIC. She is imprisoned for a month at Yokohama prison, and then taken to Sugamo, the prison that was housing Japanese war criminals, including General Tojo. It was while in the Sugamo prison that Iva would finally get word of what happened to her family in the States. Her ailing mother had died in the relocation camp in 1942. The rest of the family, once released, had moved on to Chicago. She was in prison for a year uh, initially, uh, not allowed access to a lawyer, uh, only allowed uh, 20 minutes visits a month by her husband. 
It was interesting because it was a period when the U.S. was supposed to be introducing democracy into Japan, and this is what was happening to a U.S. citizen. After the year-long imprisonment, Ivo was released for lack of sufficient evidence of treason. She emerged carrying a bouquet of flowers brought by Philippe. Following her release, uh, Iva and her husband go about living their lives in Japan. Uh, certainly in this period, uh, difficult at best. She becomes pregnant and decides that she wants to give birth to this child in the land of her birth, the United States. She has a number of problems. She never had her status absolutely documented. She had failed, of course, during those war years to secure a proper passport. She now applies for the proper documentation to re-enter the United States. And now problems begin. The problems began with the breathless and staccato broadcasts of Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Nob and South America and all the ships and curtains at sea. Let's go to France, France, New York. The most thrilling spectacle in the history of New York. Walter Winchell, who was one of the most influential columnists and broadcasters at the time, takes the case of Iva Taguri and makes it national news again, arguing that we should not only not allow this traitor to return freely to the country, but we should bring her back and try her for treason. Walter Winchell was totally and utterly unscrupulous. I mean, nothing one could say bad about the press today would be bad enough to say about Winchell. And he just manufactured a case for his own reasons without listening to anybody, including a colleague who had been to Tokyo and told him that there was no story there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, winds up another edition of the Jurgen's Journal on the next Sunday night at the very same time. I remain your New York correspondent, Walter Winchell. Good night. Incited by Winchell, the public outcry reached a crescendo in 1948, and President Harry Truman felt pressure to react. Harry Truman was being charged with being soft on communists, soft on spies, and in order to prove that he was not soft, uh, he dispatched his attorney general of the day, Tom Clark, to uh, find out if there was a case, make a case against Tokyo Rose. In many ways, it was a witch hunt. On the orders of Tom Clark, the Attorney General, she was charged with treason. And of course, Japan is not American territory, but it was American territory at the time because it was under occupation. So she could be arrested in Japan and brought back to the United States for trial. Iva Degori's baby had not survived past birth. And now under arrest, her long-awaited passage back to the United States was as a prisoner. And she was brought back on a troop ship of um, largely a celebratory atmosphere on board of people who were coming home. But she was brought back in a cell, you know, under guard, and had to walk ashore in a family to see her in disgrace and so forth. And then it took another year to bring her to trial. Iva Tagore sailed to San Francisco to face America as a scapegoat and guilty or not, before the court date, she was convicted in the public eye. I'll bet you sorry, now Tokyo Rose. Sorry for what you've done. I'll bet you sorry that you went to work for that old rising sun. You stuck a knife into the USA. You forgot what they learned you at UCLA. I'll bet you're sorry now, Tokyo Road. Sorry for what you... Sorry for what you've done. You can see a woman who has changed when she realizes that the force of the United States government is now going to turn from the father of her country, essentially, to her accusator. And they're going to prosecute her for the dread charge of treason. On July 5th, 1949, at the Federal District Court in San Francisco, 
Iba Tagori's treason trial was opened. The trial of Tokyo Rose was symptomatic of, uh, of that period. Uh, we were punitive. Uh, we wanted to find victims. Convenient scapegoats were available, and she would certainly be a very visible scapegoat. And it would justify all of the actions that uh, we did against not only the nation of Japan, but Japanese Americans. Wayne Collins, the attorney for Eva Taguri, told me the story of the prosecution bringing in discs, big transcriptions, supposedly recorded shortwave of Iva's broadcasts. And there are recordings that are out there, but there are no recordings with treasonous statements on them. So the prosecutor put the transcriptions on the table, but never played them for the jury. Ultimately, the key evidence against Iva Taguri was offered by two eyewitnesses who had worked for the Japanese. They both testified that they saw and heard Iva Taguri broadcasting in late October 1944 a propaganda broadcast on the Zero Hour. The jury was terribly divided. They took a week to come to finally a decision, which was rested out of them by the fact that they wanted to go home. The outcome of the federal trial in San Francisco was that she was found guilty. And one certainly senses that the pressure was on to find her guilty. On September 29th, after 78 hours of deliberation, the jury found Iva guilty of an overt act of treason. She was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison and fined $10,000. Her attorney called the verdict guilty without evidence. Iva Tagori had a clear conscience after she was convicted of treason and sent to jail in 1948 but the same could not be said of the government's witnesses against her. It's now felt that the witnesses were persuaded or coerced to testify to what the government wanted, wanted to hear. A number are reported to have recanted their testimony, saying that Iva was innocent. So now, looking back, they feel guilty in having pointed a finger at Iva. After the trial in San Francisco, uh, Iva's husband returned to Japan, uh, signing a document with the US government that he would never try to re-enter the United States. Well, this meant that Iva and her husband were now uh, separated, not only because she went to prison, but also because the United States would now not let her husband return. On January 28th, 1956, Iva Tagori was released from prison into an uncertain future. Iva Tagori, though sentenced to 10 years in prison, got off for good behavior without the last three years of the sentence. When she was released, she found her father still alive and some vestige of her family living in Chicago. And, uh, and the father, by that time, had become proprietor of a Japanese shop. But the events that had buffeted Iva's life had taken their toll. She had spent seven years behind bars, and an ocean would always separate her from her husband. Iva's life was changed forever. She was dealt a bad hand of cards. And innocent in her mind, she felt that she had been deprived of liberty and pursuit of happiness because she could never again rebuild with the confidence of being the American citizen. In fact, on parole as a convicted traitor, Iva was now a stateless person, and the Immigration Service had begun deportation proceedings against her as an undesirable alien. Do you consider yourself a citizen or an alien as far as this hearing is concerned, this deportation hearing? 
Well, I think I'm United States citizen. I was born here. I don't know what else I could be. In other words, you intend to fight any deportation proceedings? That I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, how I, it's going to be handled. Do you have any regrets? What do you mean, uh, regrets? Uh, for having broadcast for the Japanese. I'd rather not comment on that. In May of 1956, Iva traveled back to San Francisco to contest the deportation. It was here that her old attorney, Wayne Collins, would successfully fight the proceedings over a period of two years. Though she was not deported, Iva lived for 20 years in Chicago as a non-citizen. Finally, in 1976, a campaign to set the record straight was about to culminate. It was championed by her attorney's son, Wayne Collins, Jr., himself an attorney. He hoped to win Iva Tagore a presidential pardon. What Wayne Collins, Jr. presented as an argument was exactly how she fell into this, that she did everything she could to be patriotic, that she did nothing intentionally to harm the United States, and uh, that she was a victim of the hysteria of the times. As Gerald Ford entered his final months as president in 1976, he became interested in the plight of the woman he knew as Tokyo Rose. Then in December, an article by journalist John Leggett appeared in the New York Times magazine that won over the president's opinion. After the piece came out and uh, there was some conjecture among my friends and uh, in talking to the editors at the Times, about the possibility that the piece did do the job. I remember being assured by friends, and when, when in fact the pardon did come out, that the, the piece had been instrumental. Finally, on January 19th, the morning before he was to leave office, President Gerald Ford signed an executive grant of clemency. It announced that Ivan Tagore had been granted a full unconditional pardon. Her citizenship was restored. I think it pleased her very much uh, to get a pardon like that. It's, it's sort of a validation of uh, her innocence that she had been looking for over all these years. I think she is content. She is not bitter. She has put it aside and accepts it uh, as fate, I think. She happened to be in the position at the time. And um, she's a strong enough person to stand up and survive. Fifty years after the war, Iva Tagori was settled in Chicago running the family store, selling goods imported from Japan and living quietly amongst friends. Her story will always be remembered because the story of Tokyo Rose will not be forgotten.